This is our fifth episode of Unforgotten. Uh, I am with the Notre Dame baseball team. I got two members of the team with me. It's Jack Siska and Nico Cavadas. Guys, I appreciate you joining me on Unforgotten. First, I just want to check in with each of you. And why don't you tell me where you're joining me today and just how things have been going the last six uh, weeks. We'll start with you, Jack. Yeah, um, checking in from Berkeley, New Jersey. Um, things have been going pretty well. Um, initially, it was tough to find a way to, you know, uh, fill out my free time. Um, but now that I've kind of gotten a routine and, you know, figured out what's what, I'm uh, doing all right, hanging in there. Not too bad. Yeah, for me, uh, I'm checking in from Granger, Indiana. I'm just a hop, skip, and a jump from Notre Dame, which is nice. But uh, recently, as Jack said, it's been tough to fill all the free time. But uh, I've been able to get on to my old Little League field. And uh, so being able to get out there, take some swings, uh, field some ground balls, it's, it's been really, really cool. Let's, let's actually start with that, Nico. What have you been able to do? You're one of the few athletes I've talked about. A couple of the golfers were able to actually get out and golf because it's one of the, the sports you can, you can play under these circumstances. What have you been able to do? And I guess who have you been working with to, to stay sharp? Yeah, so for me, um, as I said, like the weather here, same at South Bend. It's, uh, it's been tough. We had four inches of snow, and then three days later, it's 60 degrees and shining, and we're outside. So uh, when we can get outside, my little brother's 18. Uh, he plays baseball at Penn High School down the road. So uh, he's been awesome. It's like a built-in catch partner, BP thrower, a fungo hitter. So I've got, I've got like a, a mini coach there, uh, which is always helpful. Um, and when we're not able to get outside, uh, I'm lucky enough where um, – the hitting facility that we're members of uh, is kind of like completely hands off, punch in, go get your work in, punch out. And so they have a little lock pad on the door. So they've been able to stay open, which is really, really nice. So I've always got a, a place to go swing it. Jack, what, what about you? How, have you been able to, to get any work in in the last six weeks? Yeah. Um, New Jersey has been pretty bad um, in terms of the whole coronavirus spread. So I've had to get creative um, in the first half of the, I don't want to call this the off season, but whatever this is, um, parks and high schools and stuff are open. So I would, my brother's 18 too. So we would uh, go down to the field, we'd throw, we'd run, um, and I hit whenever I could. Now that that's all shut down, they're not allowing anybody to go on public parks or high schools. So uh, I ordered a tee and a net, and I've been going, getting after it on a tee a little bit. Um, I've been staying in shape. My mom ordered a Peloton, so. Mm -hmm. I I've been uh, been doing that just to feel out, you know, like I'm doing something. Um, but I've definitely got need to get creative. Hey, I, I actually got a Peloton too. I got it two and a half weeks ago. Yeah, are, I love it. Um, are you riding a lot? A hundred percent every day. <laughs> um, I do whenever I can. Yeah. Who's your favorite instructor? Real quick. I mix it up. I honestly mix it up, and okay. I'm I'm a proponent of doing it based on the music more so than the instructor. Okay. Um, so whatever kind of mood I'm in, I uh, I'll pick it based on the music. Yeah, it's been huge to, to stay active. Um, all right, I want to go back six weeks or so. Um, and, and Nico, I'll, I'll, I want to hear from you first, then we'll, we'll hear from Jack. But just tell me how you found out that your season was coming to this abrupt end. Where were you? Who delivered the information? And then just what went through your head as, as you learned that the season was, was going to be cut short? Yeah, so we had just uh, come off a big series win in North Carolina where we took three from the Tar Heels. Um, made our way down to Radford. We were on our spring break trip, so we were on the road for a while then. Uh, we were headed towards the, the home stretch, the back end of that, of that trip, and we had showed up at Louisville um, really late that night, slept in, gotten up. It was time for us to go get a lift in on a Thursday. Uh, we were feeling really good, really confident in our ability to win that series. That's one uh, our class had circled for a really long time as if there was one series we're going to win, it's going to be this one. And uh, – we get on the bus, head to go lift, and all of a sudden, Twitter is just an absolute madhouse. And people are yelling updates from all over the bus about what's going on. And we see that, uh, like, the Ivy Leagues have suspended all seasons. And we're like, oh, my goodness. And then all of a sudden, there was – I think we were suspended. And we heard it from Twitter first, which was kind of weird. And all of a sudden, the bus turns around and starts heading back. And – uh we get off the bus and coach Jarrett looks at us and is like team room right now. We're like, all right. Uh, we make our way into the team room and he starts breaking down our most recent game, which was absolutely hilarious. He's all business all the time. He's like, listen, Radford, 
we had some poor at bats. We've got to be better. <laughs> we're like, we're like all this uncertainty in the air, and he he has to get off his chest that <laughs> that we struggled in the box a little bit against Radford, and everyone kind of giggled a little bit. But he was he was adamant about it. So we finished that, and then he started talking about you know like this is where we're at right now, and he was you could tell he was as upset as we were. He has put in so much time and so much effort and energy into this season. So. Uh, you could hear the disappointment in his voice. And his main thing was, listen, as I get information, I'll, I promise I'll distribute it to you immediately. But I don't have any more information than you guys have seen. So um, that's kind of like how quick it all happened. One minute we were headed the lift to prep for a series against our rival. And the very next minute we were, we were banged. So that was really tough. Jack, I mean, what about you? I, I, I mean, you were on the bus, I assume, as well. Just what was going through your head? Yeah, um, that story that Nico said is pretty much basically true. Uh, I'm not on social media. I'm not on Twitter. So I was in the middle of the bus and you hear kids from the front of the bus and hear kids from the back of the bus shouting different reports at one another. Um, certainly hectic, but uh, yeah, the bus turns around and uh, coach after he broke down how we could have done better at Radford was like, listen, um, our season has been put to an end. Uh, and I don't really know what to tell you, but he started navigating uh, travel plans and whatnot. So uh, you certainly get the feeling that like the rug was pulled out from underneath you. We had a really, really good feeling about the season um, and thought we were going to, you know, turn some heads and do something special in South Bend. Um, and to not get the chance to kind of play that season out uh, certainly was a punch in the gut. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the start you guys were off to. I think it was the best start in five years. You guys were 11-2. and two. Like you said, you beat North Carolina, which is a great program. And then you were going to Louisville. Nico, why don't you tell me, just because you, you alluded to it a little bit, that was a series you guys had circled. I mean, to li I didn't know that the bus had turned around like that. To literally have the bus turn around as you were on your way to play this, this weekend series that you had been looking forward to so much. I mean, how much – did it make it sting that much more to have that happen that way at that time? Yeah. Um, so Louisville's a really good program, um, really good program. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we had the potential, we had the talent to have a really special season, as Jack said. So we wanted my class specifically, the junior class, had had this circled and said, this is the weekend we make a statement. This is the weekend that we put Notre Dame baseball back on the map. And so we were – after sweeping North Carolina, absolutely fired up. And we knew that that was our chance to revitalize the Notre Dame program and um, get it back going in the direction that I know it, it's headed now. And so to see all of that work that we had put in to beat Louisville uh, kind of go by the wayside, it was, it was really difficult, really, really difficult. You know, Jack, this year, it was the first year under, you know, your new head coach. And like Nico said, you guys were trying to put – Notre Dame baseball back on the map. I'm just curious, what, what do you think was different this year? What was allowing you guys to succeed throughout the first month of the season and have the kind of start to the year that you guys did have? Yeah, I'll, there's definitely a bunch of things that um, contributed, and I'm sure Nico can attest to a lot of them. Um, I'd say first and foremost that the team culture made a, almost a complete 180. Um, we had a, a tremendous atmosphere in the locker room a great feel around practice and scrimmages and preseason workouts. So I think that kind of bled into the performance on the field first. Um, I think we were better prepared offensively and defensively to go win games. Um, and as simple as that sounds, I just, I feel like we were, you know, in the moment in games and we were expecting to win them, um, which sounds kind of basic, but it's true. Um, and I feel like once you start to win a couple games, you kind of, uh, build up that momentum and I feel like it's kind of self self evolving in the sense that you win your first series at UAB and it's like all right let's go and then you can build on build upon that build upon that and then uh, like Nico said uh, take three in Chapel Hill you start feeling really good about yourself going into Louisville and going into the rest of the ACC play. Um, you know I talked to the women's lacrosse team and they were I think number two in the country and they were headed that next, they didn't have the bus turn on them, but they were headed to North Carolina to play number one the next weekend. And their reaction, you know, they were obviously devastated. They had this big game they were looking forward to similar to, to you guys. They didn't get to play it. They were, they were mostly upset that they just didn't get to have that moment. 
Um, and they admitted that like the, and I talked to them, I guess a little earlier in the process, but they hadn't done a lot of work in the first two to three weeks after they kind of stayed away from lacrosse. It sounds like both of you have been working on your skill set the best way you can. And, and it sounds like it started with coach Jarrett breaking down your bats, you know, before, when the bus got back, I mean, it, it seems like the mindset has been still like full speed ahead. We're preparing for next year. I guess first is, has that been the case? And then second, like, how are you staying motivated? during this time when there's still a lot of uncertainty. And even if baseball starts up at the scheduled time next year, that's still almost an entire full year away. How have you guys maintained that mindset? And I'll start with you, Nico. Yeah. So I, I've been, or I've always been a big proponent of the idea that if you're not getting better, you're getting worse because everyone around you is going to be getting better and you're just going to slowly slide down that totem pole. So uh, I, I also believe that everyone has, an on off switch and when the season comes around everyone's on switch or everyone's switch is turned on and the minute you turn it off it's really really difficult to turn it back on so one of the things that coach Jared had been preaching was you don't know when the next time you're going to get on a field is you don't know there's so much uncertainty so you've got to stay sharp you don't want to let yourself get dull and have to resharpen what you've got you've got to stay sharp and continue uh, sharpening what we have. So that was, that was kind of coach Jarrett's thought process. And I think it's really motivated all of us to, to stay sharp in this time. And additionally, we had gotten off to such a strong start and that is motivation in itself. Like that feeling as coach Jarrett constantly talks about collecting those last few outs in a game is a feeling unlike any other. It's an addictive feeling and it's something that you want to chase. So when it's, 6 a.m. and you want to go get swings and ground balls in before you have to start class like that's the kind of thing that pulls you out of bed in the morning that chasing that feeling of winning a ball game stringing ball games together putting your name back on the map that's a really really special thing what about you jack um i'll build upon what nico just said i love the the, the motivation of feeling like you're doing something bigger than just yourself i feel like being motivated knowing that we were building towards something great you have a great attitude about wanting to pursue that even further um, and staying motivated for that. And I feel like if, if you just do your part individually, that's going to add up and you're going to win games. And then that's going to be the part that uh, changes the, the whole culture around Notre Dame. Like Nico said, we were starting that, but, you know, kind of came to an end. Um, I've always been taught to, you know, never let your guard down. Um, I feel like the minute, like Nico said, you turn that off switch. You, or sorry, you turn that switch to off. It's really hard to get back into the swing of things. So feeling like, uh, you know, it's just another day and trying to outwork everybody else. Um, I'm a big proponent of, uh, like, comparing myself to other people. When I'm in the weight room, I think, you know, what would another kid do that's in my position? I've been feeling like my spot's never really safe. I mean, I don't want to name drop, but, like, you know, kids on other teams like Louisville, North Carolina, Florida State. Um, you know, what are they doing right now? Um, and doing my work to try to get, get ahead of them because that's – end of the day that's that's what you're trying to be when i think of uh, teams on notre dame's campus baseball and softball are two that i think of have the toughest spring to navigate because you guys are playing all kinds of games especially that first couple months we were on the road so much uh, i'm just curious what life has been like as you've transitioned back home and have been studying from home i imagine there's a world in which it might be a little bit easier to manage the workload now i don't know i'm just guessing um, but I guess just what have been the biggest transitions you've had to make in the last uh, six weeks with this new, you know, learning from home setup? Jack, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, <laughs> I was explaining this to my family that uh, you, you get so used to having your days consumed from like nine in the morning till 10 or 11 at night. Um, in the fall and the spring, especially the spring, obviously with travel and whatnot, but having your day consumed for that long of a time period and then going complete 180 the other direction has been a little strange to get used to. Um, and you got to find ways to fill time as we were talking about before. Um, certainly been focusing on academics a little more, which is good. Um, gives you a little breathing room and some time to uh, process the information and take exams on what I think is a level playing field. Finally, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, but finding, you know, different things to fill your free time, uh, you know, watching TV shows or I'm starting to read another book, which is good. So doing anything you can to fill the free time. Important to read. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nico, what about you? 
Yeah, Jack's absolutely right. Um, you you ha- you get into this schedule, this routine where it's go 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 from like nine to nine, and then you kind of try and fit in a social life, and you fit in kind of hobbies and things you want to do around that. So now that I wake up and I don't have an obligation until class and then class is over and I don't have an obligation until class tomorrow. It's, it's very difficult to fill that time. So for me, like uh, a couple of my teammates uh, just before the season had ended, had taught me how to play chess. So I've been uh, teaching my family how to play chess and learning that. And additionally, I played the piano growing up, uh, played it like sixth or eighth grade. So I've been uh, teaching myself some more piano, trying to learn some new songs, trying to stay busy inside the house without uh, risking you know, anything that's going on in the, in the outside world. Jack, you pick up any hobbies like chess while you're, while you're back at home? You know, Nick, funny thing Nico mentioned chess. He had been trying to teach me how to play. <laughs> um, and it, that, in the airport, so that would just end up him beating me in like six moves. So that was really fun. I kind of out on chess. Um, but I have been reading. I, I, at school, I would read before I went to bed every night. Um, and here I just have been using that to occupy more of my time because I have more free time. So, um, yeah, besides reading, I'll, I picked up a couple new shows. Uh, that, that, that was really about it. <laughs> my family has gotten so into Wicked Tuna, like the most oh, right. thing ever. We get on Nat Geo, we get on Disney Plus, and we just binge watch Wicked Tuna. It's, I, I have made it, it, it's on my bucket list now that I want to throw the harpoon and I want to put a dart through a, a massive bluefin tuna. Like, it's going to happen. <laughs> The whole Cavadas clan on a boat out there. I can imagine that. Can you? <laughs> that sounds fun. You let me know when you get out there. Absolutely. Um, I want to make sure we get a chance. You know, we've talked about it a little bit already, and, and we talked about the UNC series. But with every team that we, we talked to, I just want to make sure we get a chance to kind of reflect on the, the part of the season that you guys did get to have. I think, obviously, everyone will look back at this being the season that got cut short. But as we mentioned, there was still plenty that was accomplished. You guys went 11 and two, the sweep over North Carolina. I know Nico, you, I think it was what, seven home runs in 13 games. You were off to a, to a good start. Just when you look back at this season, and now that we're six weeks away, maybe you've had time to reflect on it. Or maybe, maybe you haven't. Just what are some of the, the memories that will come to mind when you think about, you know, the shortened season, the things that either happened on the field, maybe it's on the bus whatever it might be, what are, what are the things that you can, you can tell me that, <laughs> that happened uh, in this season that you'll think you'll look back fondly on uh, down the road? And, and I'll, I'll start with Jack. Um, the first thing, you know, you, you miss being around the guys. Um, that We had a really good group of guys. Um, obviously, you, you know, you love everybody in, in my class being a sophomore, um, being some of my closest friends. But even the freshman class, getting to know them was fun. Um, Looking back on it, the UNC series definitely stands out. Um, obviously, the big series that we had played um, in that short season, but uh, it was definitely a good one. And then starting out at UAB, the first series of the year is always a big or a good memory, just because you know you get out from the brutal South Bend winter and you're out playing baseball again. Um, so when I look back at the season, that's definitely a memory that stands out to me. And uh, taking two or three from them, which was cool. I'll let Nico tell. Uh, a story that I think we're both thinking of. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I was really hoping you wouldn't take my story because I'm really proud of this one. So obviously, as he stated, like the guys are like the thing you remember, like games come and go, but like those friendships, those memories, that brotherhood lasts forever. And part of that is like brazzing each other. And uh, <laughs> this is a good one. This is a long story, so buckle up. I I can't wait. This is what we're here for. So uh, it was game two, I believe, at North Carolina. And we were up a few runs. I think we were up like eight to four. Then all of a sudden they kind of scrapped back, put some at-bats together. They tied it up. We go into extra innings. And Eric Gilgenbach, fifth-year senior, who was my roommate that weekend, smokes a three-run double down the line. And everyone is ecstatic. And, like, we – end up winning the game like that was a moment like a season defining moment like the Irish are tough and we finish and we head back and we're in the lobby of the hotel and I look down and I see this little plant in the lobby that they've got three of and I was like oh god this could this could be good and I bring this plant up to Eric I I take it out of the lobby and bring it up to the room and he's like what is that and I was I was walking by the front desk uh the front desk worker looked at me and said, Hey, do you know Eric Gilgenbach? I said, yeah. 
And she goes, will you give him this fern? It's, uh, it's our prize to him for being the player of the game. And Eric is like, no way. That is incredible. Like, earn the fern. That's going to be our new motto. Like, all of this kind of th- stuff. He's super excited. He's on FaceTime with his dad telling him about how cool it is. He's telling his girlfriend about how the front desk gave him a fern. And the next morning, we're downstairs, and uh, Matt Paris is there with us. And he's Googling earn the fern as I tell him this story. <laughs> And it turns out that um, one of the big rugby teams, I think it's the New Zealand rugby team, their, their female team is called the Black Ferns. And everyone who makes an Olympic team for New Zealand gets shipped a fern. And that's like their acceptance, their like initiation. And so Earn the Fern was a really big thing for them. So we started this hashtag Earn the Fern and Eric makes an Instagram page for this fern that he calls Fernie Sanders. And the Instagram handle is still <laughs> fern. It's still out there. And um, he starts taking it with him everywhere and taking pictures with it. He loves this fern. That until- him on the bus. Yeah, it's on the bus <laughs> and everywhere. And we just get out of a big win at Radford and I text Sean. I'm like, cause Sean is our director of ops and he's in on the whole thing. And I was like, Sean, send a message in the players group chat saying that we experienced a surcharge for $75 at the North Carolina hotel for a missing vegetation. <laughs> and so he sends this message like, Hey guys, big win, like proud of you. But however, we're, we just got a surcharge for missing vegetation in the lobby. Like, does anyone know anything about this? And the entire team is in on this joke, except there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so all of a sudden he reads this message and he reads it again. And he had to have read it six or seven times because it wasn't a long message. And it was like three or four minutes that he's staring at his phone and we're all staring at him. And all of a sudden he peeks his head up and goes, wait, the fern's not real. And everyone <laughs> just erupted laughing. And it was like one of the most unforgettable moments. I was so proud of our team for like, five or six days not giving it away it was it was an incredible experience and that's the type of thing that you take with you forever that is a classic baseball team story and of course it it happened uh, like on the bus driving somewhere so and it's uh, a dear guy who's experienced five years of an elite education and still falls (laughs) for he's a notre dame graduate give you a fern earn the fern i like to start following that women's uh, rugby team too, just to see what, what they're like with the earn the fern. That sounds like uh, <laughs> ferns are a, a point of pride for them. Uh, that's awesome. I love that story. Um, but the last thing I want to just ask you guys is, you know, throughout this process, one thing I've asked everyone is just who maybe um, within the Notre Dame community has been someone that's helped you throughout the last four to six weeks kind of get through or, or adjust to this new normal, whether it's, people on the team coaching staff it could be support staff or just classmates or even professors just is there someone that sticks out that you've been really grateful for their help throughout the last you know four to six weeks and I'll I'll start with uh with you Jack um well my mind just went initially was was I leaned on my teammates more so than anybody I think um a lot of us try to plan our schedule so that we all take if not the same classes with the same professors at least like very similar classes um, and, and not being in like a physical classroom environment makes it difficult because, you know, if you don't understand something from a lecture, it's tough to kind of like put the puzzle pieces together almost. Um, and definitely having people to kind of rely on and bounce ideas back and forth, um, has been great. And also on a non-academic note, you know, making it feel like you didn't leave, you know, you kind of miss, miss the guys, like I said before, um, and uh, staying in touch with them and making sure, you know, you don't look like you dropped off the face of the planet or something. Um, that's ever been nice. Yeah, for me, I would say, like, the biggest adjustment has been academically um, assimilating into the online classes. So I think Nick Maneri has been super, super helpful with me. Um, schedule classes. He's our academic advisor. And uh, he's been, like, in contact with me every single day, making sure that, um, caught up and I'm working well with my professors and he's just been like a, a middle piece of the puzzle that kind of goes unnoticed because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, academic uh, work put on our plate and Nick is really good at helping us with all of it so he's been super super beneficial for us 
Well, guys, I appreciate you joining me uh, on this episode of Unforgotten. You know, like with all the teams we've talked to, uh, I'm bummed that you didn't get a chance to finish the season. You guys were off to a great start. And again, to have it stop before that big series at Louisville, I think had a lot of people bummed. So I, I know we'll be get a chance to see you guys back on the field, hopefully sooner rather than later. But I appreciate you talking to me today. So thanks a lot. No problem. Thanks for having me. Appreciate and, it. Uh, and earn the, earn the firm. That's right. Earn the firm. <laughs> You have been listening to an official Notre Dame Athletics podcast presented by Fighting Irish Media.